program was launched as a pilot by, uh, by uh, CIC, Canada, uh, Canada Immigration and Citizenship, uh, which is the Canadian federal government as an arm of the uh, Canadian federal government. It was launched as a pilot in 2013. Um, and it was designed to uh, essentially uh, look at bringing in entrepreneurs that are innovative, can create jobs for Canadians, and can com uh, compete on a global scale. Um, what the program does is it grants permanent, uh, uh, permanent resident status uh, to foreign entrepreneurs who intend to operate a business in Canada. Um, and, and it's an expedited process, so the stats are coming in at around 5.3 months to process um, from application to granting of PR, obviously subject to you know, individual cases. Um, now, the, the interesting thing is that these entrepreneurs need to get a letter of support from one of three uh, designated entities, and I'll go into them in more detail, but um, and, and these in, in diminishing capital requirements, there's a group of venture capital firms where the uh, letter of support would need to include a $200,000 investment commitment, um, an angel investor group uh, that would need to invest, uh, commit to invest at least $75,000, or a business incubator that needs to commit to supporting the, uh, the entrepreneur and their startup, uh, but doesn't actually need to make a capital investment into the company. Um, so, in terms of eligibility, um, so I'll get into the uh, designated entities in a moment. Um, in terms of the eligibility, um, the so obviously the letter of support, so they're going to need some support from one of those three de streams of designated entities. Um, the business must be incorporated in Canada ultimately. It does not need to be incorporated in Canada at the time that they receive the commitment from one of the designated entities. I mean, obviously, you know, or, you know, you have a business in Brazil, and then you got to reincorporate in Canada. You have to do the, you know, to redomicile, do the tax work, do you know, deal with you know, stakeholders. So, so, you know, it makes sense that they can, you can defer incorporation until you're, you know, pretty much ready to press play. Um, and um, and uh, um, it's 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 a program that supports up to five applicants. The, the applicants are, you know, essentially the founders of the company. Uh, each applicant needs to hold at least 10% ownership or voting, um, voting shares in the company. So it's really, I mean, economics and control. Happy to, to, to you know, talk about that at, at length. Um, but, you know, you, you know, it's really about the controlling stake. They need to hold at least 10% of it. Uh, each applicant needs to hold it. Um, and, and either and collectively, the applicants need to hold the control in the company. At least 50% of the voting rights of the company need to be held by the applicants. If there's only one applicant; they need to hold at least 50%. Um, so you know, but a minimum of 10 per applicant. Um, one you know one hurdle um, that we've seen is is um, IP ownership. Um, you know, typically the companies that are coming under the startup visa tend to be innovative and, and rather IP rich or planning to be IP uh, rich or heavy rather. Um, and so, you know, while, while there's not a robust set of guidelines on this from the government, um, it, it, there, there, is a, there is a control requirement. It doesn't mention ownership, but it says that the IP or the assets needed to operate the business must, you know, must be controlled uh, by the Canadian entity. Um, so, you know, whether that's a transfer or a license, I mean, you know, that's a debate, but, you know, the idea is control on, by the Canadian company. Um, and so, you know, the way that we've approached these deals is we, we've, we've, uh, we've worked with local council um, in the, you know, in the home country of the entrepreneur to make sure that the, the legal and the tax uh, structures are right and respected in their local countries because some either you know, some will keep their operations or parts of their operations in their home countries and move the executives to Canada under the program. Some will just move their entire entity. It's not as much of an issue there, but, you know, again, there are some tax issues that, you know, um, that need to be sorted out. I feel like the, the number of times every day I say I'm not a tax lawyer is kind of getting <laughs> annoying at this point. Um, 
And so the de there's three three streams for uh, for the designated entity organizations that I talked about. There's the venture capital stream, there's the uh, angel investor stream, and there's the business incubator stream. Again, the VC stream, two hundred thousand dollar investment. Angels, a minimum of seventy-five thousand um, dollars, and the business incubators uh, is uh, is uh, there's no capital requirement yet, but there is a support threshold there. Who is this for? Uh, what is the company? What's the ideal company? I mean, for seventy-five thousand dollars, are you going to rip up your company from a certain country and bring it to Canada? So what is it? Um, I wish I had, you know. A direct answer for all that, but let me just maybe unpack that a bit in terms of so. Great point about the universities. Um, you know, we deal a lot with that in terms of the tech transfer coming out of universities, and I think you know it varies from different you know from university to university. I think you know there you know we've seen a lot of deals where universities have taken a modest stake, you know, an equity stake in the company, and it's structured in a way that doesn't you know hurt the company going forward from a control or consent perspective that, you know, I think reasonable arrangements can be made with universities with respect to tech transfer, you know, they have a piece of the upside. Um, and so, so that's, you know, that's, that's one piece of it. The, the, the 75 grand um, from Angels, you're right, that's not a lot of money. Um, and we hope Angels invest more than 75,000 bucks. Our, our minimum investment. But it's just a minimum. There's like 300,000 up. Which would be great. We're really talking seed stage. Yeah, and seed so seed the idea is is less about the money and more about the fact that there's a commitment and that someone somebody's willing to put in something to support the business. Like, is it investable or not? You know, if the check size is a million bucks, great. But if the checks, it just has to be something that's a little bit more than a trivial amount to say that these people are willing to put some of their money in to support this business coming over here. Hey, I would you invest in this business? If you if you don't and you're an angel group, then what what's you know, what are the issues that you're seeing? Well then maybe the government doesn't want to necessarily take up that business. So that's exactly what they're I think they're looking for is having, you know, these objective investors looking at the deal and saying, yeah, you know what, I wouldn't I'm not going to invest in that company. And if nobody's going to invest in it, it may be tougher for them to survive here. So I think that that's where you know, it's less about the actual dollar figure, I, I think, in terms of the angels, and more about is someone going to write a check. Um, but, uh, but yeah, a lot of interesting you know debate on that. In terms of you know sort of taking, yeah, I'll get one second. In terms of taking the company out of its home country or not, that depends on the business. You know, some people, I mean, we we've seen companies who have uh, you know come from India, went to the valley and said, I actually don't want to build my business in the Valley, I want to build it in Toronto, and their development team, their development team is in their home country for cost purposes, um, and they know the business really well, but you know, their executives wanted to be in their be in, in Toronto for their business, and they run, you know, their executives are run, running, you know, their head, heads of sales, et cetera, are running out of Toronto. So you do see a bit of bifurcation depending on, you know, the staffing. I just wanted to add a little bit on the other side, because he said like the investor side, but on the startup side, even though it's only 75, or like to get 75 for a company that's coming from outside, and there is the risk of like more than 50% need to be owned by that foreign, it's really hard. Like even though it's just 75 for the startup uh, coming from like Latin America, like, it's, it's really hard. Yeah, I think um, right. It's more sign up, you know, approval. I yeah. Think, to get that trust and all. So, so it's more the interest of the Canadian market in that business idea rather than rather than money, basically. Yeah, and it's also it's also I mean, at the end of the day, it's the government um, wanting you know people in this room to make decisions about the companies, you know, vetting vetting the opportunity. There is one question about the uh, voting rights that you were talking before, uh, yeah. Brent. And I always have this question because my, uh, what we have is um, an e-rate between an equator and a salarator, but we are non-profit, like 80% of the equators are non-profit. But the, uh, one of the requests is that the, the voting rights are, you know, are between the um, designated companies 
and the company has to be 50 percent. It would be like the, the as a founders, like the operator. So like if you serve you have a company and you're coming to Canada, you're one founder, you need you need to have at least 50 percent of the votes of that company. If you have a couple other founders, then you know you don't necessarily need to own a majority stake, but you do need to own at least 10 percent of the voting rights. So it's more like the company operators. My concern is more for the designated organizations. Applicants and designated organizations jointly hold more than 50%. That means that the designated organization has to have equity over the startup or how they have voting rights. No, that's a great point. So it's not mandatory for uh, no mandatory. the designated entity to take an equity stake. Oh, okay. okay. However, it's quite customary for the designated entity to take an equity stake. I mean, if you're investing money, you take an equity stake, but if you're an incubator that has, you know, other missions and that kind yeah. of thing, then you don't need to take an equity. Stake. Oh, okay, so it's debt. It can be convertible debt, uh, but but again, that that's that's why. So if you have a safe or convertible debt, you know, convertible note, sorry, then you know you may not show up on the cap table as a <coughs> voting shareholder at the time that the commitment is made. And that's you know that's why there's no mandatory requirement for an investor to hold an equity stake, a voting share at the time of the commitment is made. So, um, okay. So designated VC funds. Um, here's a list. Designated angel and in, uh, investor groups. There's a list. Uh, and then incubators. I mean, incubators is a pretty busy, busy space. Um, and uh, I guess it's not totally complete. There's probably one or two that are not uh, that are not on there. A um, couple examples. Uh, I'll give Biz Airlines. It's an on-demand private jet company. Came from Brazil. They're based in Toronto now. Fantastic uh, founding team. Um, and uh, I guess. Again, another shameless plug about dentists and our global coverage. Mm -hmm. um, so, so again, I mean, I think, I think ultimately, you know, when it comes to the startup visa, you have to think about, you know, or if you're an investor or you know, a, an influencer or advisor in the community, you have to think about does this work, you know, for the companies that you're operating, companies that you're servicing or investing in. You know, there's going to be local considerations. It's not for everybody. Um, but you know, it's it, it, it's a fantastic tool to you know to bring you know to allow founders to you know exploit the North American market. You know, use Toronto as a as a, as a gateway into into North America. We've seen that a lot. It's worked out really well. Please. Do you have some numbers like how many visa was issued? Where you should in the last five years? I I I, I read something. It's Pretty low no, no more than 500, something like that. Yeah, it's a pretty. It was a pretty low amount, something like that. Like I think the government left room for 2,500, I think, or 2,200 per year. 2,270 per year. Yeah, and it's it was probably like 70 versus the 2,270. So what's the problem? Like, is it the background checks, or is it they couldn't raise money, or just they gave up? The, the process is too long. Yeah. Um, <laughs> three, oh, five, five and a half months, right? Yes. Five and a half months now at the helm of your company. From a yeah. perspective, yeah. I, I've seen many that they don't No, but the PR the process itself is about, about three they months now. Itself. So that's about Just five months. The PR process is about three months. So the, that's not the, the PR process is about five months. Yes. Yes. But, but you, should, you need to wait five months. There are ways to come faster when you have a work permit. You can get a work permit after you make like after you submit the uh, you know commitment certificate and all that, you can get a work permit. It can take a couple weeks to come to Canada. And you can use that. You know, you know founders have sales calls they need to make, whatever it is, and they can use the work permit as a way of getting into the country faster. Um, yeah, uh, I know that the process now is uh, mostly focused on the incubators and accelerators approval. So it, actually, the government is relying on those uh, stakeholders to actually grant. Uh, the basically the PR. Correct. So, in your understanding, is this uh, is this a good way to deal with the government uh, initiative? 
initiative to rely on, the, on private partners to grant public documents? Well, I think it's certainly better than not having anything um, around this. But don't you think this is the main reason why the acceptance rate is so low? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't have the statistics. I do not work for the government, um, but I don't have the statistics on what the actual application to acceptance rates are. That's because about 179. Ex acceptance? I sir. think so. Yeah, yeah, so I mean, it's pretty, I mean, the numbers are rel still relatively low. So I think it's a pretty narrow program, narrow purpose, um, and it's like, you know, it's not a program for mass adoption, nor should it be, I think. It's not, you know, I don't think it's a tool that should bring in 40,000 businesses every year. I think it should serve a, you know, it should, it should serve a sort of a, a, a business-focused purpose. And it does take time to vet. Um, I also think that, you know, it only recently became permanent. Yeah. And, you know, have, you know, like, you know, I've, I've, I've been at a bunch of the web summits and, you know, you see a, a Canadian government group there, but it's, like, it's, you know, the, the promotion can be more, I say um, aggressive. You know, they can promote this better. Like, I think there's a lot of work to be done promoting, evangelizing the program. You know, going through the usual steps to actually market what it is. I think a lot of people don't even.